Greetings, this is Griff Ruby with yet another Nostalgia Catholic with yet another Isaac Asimov short story. And uh, he's mentioned on the cover of this issue of the magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction in October 1955. But the cover artwork pertains to a different story, Project Nurse, made by Judith Merrill. Okay. So, well, the story we are interested in, however, is the talking stone talking stone by Isaac Asimov which appears on page 107 by the way so 107 okay well there's not too much in change here in fact in the text they're almost identical, as far as I can tell, with one lone exception near the very, very end. He needed the registry number of a certain spaceship, and um, somebody says, oh, then his craggy face brightened. But I'm an idiot. The number's gone, but we can get it in a flash from the Interplan Registry. They fixed that to Interplanetary Registry. Which makes a lot more sense. I mean, this is interplanetary. This is about spaceships and asteroids and and strange rock-like beasts that live among the asteroids and feed off of all things gamma radiation. Hmm. Well, there's a nice little blurb. Let's start with the blurb here. That, of course, does not get reprinted. At about the time this issue appears, Isaac Asimov will be the guest of honor at the 13th World Science Fiction Convention. And with good cause. Now only 35. What a young guy. Asimov has been writing and selling science fiction for almost 17 years. And creating still recognized classics as long ago as 1941. His range has been unbelievably wide. From hypergalactic epics rivaling E.E. E. Smith in length and scope. To the latest development. Brief vignettes as concise and funny as those of Frederick Brown, which you'll be reading in fantasy and science fiction in the near future. But out of all of his range, which also includes both light verse and weighty textbooks, I think he'll be most remembered for two things. His formulation of the logical laws of robotics in the celebrated Positronic Robot series, and his highly successful attempts to fuse science fiction with the formal de detective story. Last January, we brought you The Singing Bell, the first of the detective adventures of Dr. Wendell Earth. Here is a second puzzle for the plump extraterrologist and for you as you are challenged by the assurance that though the crime could take place only in the space future, every clue is fairly presented for a solution by today's reader. So... After that, the text of the story. And what is the story? Well, this guy runs some sort of station on some asteroid where they help um, various travelers out in the asteroids who need various help. They need to resupply their ships with food, with equipment, I don't know, maybe even entertainment tapes or whatever technology that was involved. They didn't mention that specifically. But you, you get the idea. And to do ship repairs if that should be needed. Stuff like that. So the ship stops by and um, the guy does need some work. So he takes some time doing some work. And while he's taking that time, he discovers that there's this rock-like beast that they call a silicone. Apparently the siliconis live out in the um, asteroid belt. Most of them are really small, but there's this one that's more than a foot in diameter. Big, big thing. And uh, apparently, these things can be very smart and even learn how to talk. Hence the title, The Talking Stone. So, but he notices something else about it. The bare fact that it is so large... And he knows a lot of things. He's been reading articles about these creatures from Wendell Earth, who he will meet up with later in the story. And apparently Wendell Earth has studied these beasties and determined that things that some people think are ears that might be used for telepathy or something are actually gathering instruments 
for collecting the gamma radiation, which is where they get their energy from. They get their rock matter from the rocks, but they get their energy from gamma radiation. They normally don't grow very large unless, I guess, they get a lot of radiation, which implies some very, very rich ore of some kind or another that they are in. That's their food. And uh, it turns out that these characters who, whose ship he was helping to maintain and whose large silicon, they, things get kind of slow for a while. you got to let this thing kind of do something for a few for a few hours and there's really nothing much to do. So he kind of manages to finagle them to let him get a brief glimpse of their silicon. Very brief, but it was enough to tell him what, what he was dealing with. And it told him that these characters were obviously dealing with some very high-grade uranium ore from some asteroid somewhere. And apparently they've got this thing where only the government's allowed to do this. That It's so bad that uh, ordinary asteroid miners aren't even allowed to have a Geiger counter with them. Oof. He does have a way of portraying all these very, very strange and often very dictatorial governments. I guess it was just kind of assumed that this would happen. I mean, you got a guy who's, you know, born in Russia, you know, doubt, doubtless retained some, I don't know, sense of uh, unity or something with the homeland, even if he had long since forgotten the language and barely remembers any of the relatives he had back there specifically and personally. But there's always that kind of sense of, you know, and then there they were all those years, and even then, you know, dominated by Stalin, and, well, oh, we got lots of prospective Stalins going around today, don't we? But uh, I'm not here to comment on that right now. So, anyway, he, he manages to get the ship so that it'll be traceable. Only when they trace it, it turns out it's been hit with a meteor, and everybody's dead. He's got a good supply of very rich uranium, so at least he can prove that they were doing that, and it was right that he you know, made the ship traceable. That was okay. It could have been bad for him if it wasn't. But then on the other hand, where is the uranium-rich asteroid? Those guys knew they're all dead. But the silicon he knew, well... Silicon, he didn't really know. He just knew it as home, but he just kind of left it to his human friends or whatever they are to help him find his way back someday, I guess. And, uh, but he said, but I do know, where, oh, there's numbers. I don't know much about numbers, but uh, I think the numbers would be, they have the numbers, yeah. And where are the numbers? They're on the asteroid. That's a lot of usefulness. We need to find the asteroid. If we could find it, you know, then we could trace its motions and we recalculate those numbers. But you need the numbers to find the thing first in the vast outer reaches of outer space. They're hoping, well, if we just look around randomly, maybe one in a thousand, actually one in a million chance, we might find it. That's their only chance. If not, we just got whatever their immediate cargo was, which still isn't a bad find, but, you know, I mean, what's a small ship's cargo of uranium ore as opposed to a whole asteroid of this stuff? Um, you know, you could have nuclear power, little kingdom come on this thing, and this is all assuming uranium-based uh, nuclear power. Well, they take the whole problem to Wendell Earth, and Wendell Earth figures out you know, what on the asteroid really means is said by the silicone. It's not what everybody thought. And it's kind of a suitably clever sort of solution. The only downside of it at the end that I kind of caught it, well, it was two. There's one that they were a little harsh with that silicone animal. I mean, they're trying to get the answer off of this. And the silicone, the poor thing got injured and is sick and dying. And he's saying, what comes after death? He asked that twice. And they don't even answer that. They said, look, we'll just answer this question. And then they say, where would this be? And he finally just says, on the asteroid, that's his last words. And they're thinking, is that maybe when he dies, he'll go back to the home on the asteroid he came from? You know, is he mumbling something about that? Or is he saying something about where the numbers would be found? 
And uh, Wendell Earth concludes he's, he's actually giving something useful about where the numbers would be found. I guess the poor little creature doesn't get any real solace for its death. I mean, what could we have told it? I mean, I think we would have, position, we would have been in a position very similar to that of uh, uh, Dr. Chandra in 2010, where Hal is about to be blown up as Jupiter is turning into from a planet into a tiny star, and this whole shockwave is going to smash the hell out of Discovery, and everybody else is barely escaping for their lives. And then, you know, Hal asks him, Will I dream? And there's Dr. Chandra having to be all sincerity. He's his creator, but he says, I don't know. I don't know. He doesn't know. You know, it's a terrible position. But at any rate, we'd have to be in that position. Will you have something after death, Mr. Silicon? We don't know. We have the same problem for ourselves, and we don't have any answer for you either. Sorry. We'll just try to be here what we can to keep you company or fed or whatever else you'd like until, you know, the end. That's all we can do. You know, that, that would have been kind of a nice bit of humanity. There is one other small dangling thing at the very, very end. Dr. Earth, Dr. Earth wants as a reward for solving the problem, and he does solve the problem, but I'll leave that little spoiler to the story itself. If you want, to, if you want the spoiler, I won't give it. Read the story. Anyway, it's a short story. It's easy to find, by the way. It's not only in that original issue of uh, fantasy and science fiction, it has been included in Asmov's Mysteries. So, it's also in there, and it's still also again called the Talking Stone. Like I said, scarcely a word has changed, just interplan interplanetary, and of course the describe the opening blurb isn't there. The editors blurb in the fantasy and science fiction. Other than that, the text seems to be identical as far as I can tell. But at any rate, you can get the story for yourself to get that answer as far as the solution to that. But at the end, he wants a live silicone brought to him. Assuming one is found when they go to this uh, uranium-rich planet, maybe there's another silicone there. Assuming they find one, he can have it. That's the deal. But he's not asking for any uranium. Because, I mean, the uranium's for everybody else. That's the really valuable stuff. And that sounds all nice and generous, except What's he planning to feed to his own little pet silicone? I don't know. I don't think we'll hear about the silicone again, or at least not to any significant extent, in the remaining Wendell Earth stories, of which, sadly to say, there's only two more. One comes fairly soon, and another a number of years later on, and, and that's the end of Wendell Earth. And I don't know that, that the Talking Stone will get much further mentioned, as it was, the singing bells did get a very brief passing mention, which I know this was the same between the original and the new, but uh, I wasn't sure that it would be. That's why I had to make a special comparison. Um, basically, as well, since he did solve that thing about the, the singing bell so well, uh, anyway, that you have the previous one, um, Wendell Earth, the first Wendell Earth. So there's that kind of little reference. And even in Asmal's Mystery, the two Wendell Earths are back. These two are back to back. You read one where we talk about the singing bells. And the very next one is the stalking stone. Where So you have the little paragraph if you're reading Asmal's Mystery like a book. You have this nice little follow-on that makes sense. And if not, it's just like this to give you this nice little reference that just kind of says, Hey, look, this guy's got some status. You know? Like some of those Sherlock Holmes stories that get named and nearly all of which never surface, although you know, one or two of them do. The second stain for one I know of, but most of them don't. Same kind of thing. Anyway, that's what I have on that. It's a fun story. I, like I said, I always like the Wendell Earth stories, and, and this too does not disappoint. And that's what I have to say for it. Thanks for listening.